Welcome to the Avast Hacker Archives. It's a new series that uncovers the aha moments that hackers and researchers have uh, over the course of their careers. I'm Jaya Blue, the CISO of Avast, and today's guest is Troy Hunt. He's a super well-known security consultant, and he's known for all his awesome stuff, predominantly for, you might have heard of Have I Been Pwned? It's a website that allows users to check whether their accounts and their personal data has been compromised by data breaches. And he's most recognized for his commentary on high profile data breaches in the media and as well as his work that he's delivered to the US Congress. He's also an international speaker on web security and the author of a lot of top rated courses on Pluralsight. So thank you for joining us today. Hey Jay, thank you for having me. Troy, I, you know, I want to say, like, you've done so much over the years. I know you from Have I Been Pwned, and but, like, you've also done so much work with Microsoft and before you worked at Pfizer. And, you know, I think, like, your recognition really, I don't know, blew up for me anyway when um, I saw the attention that Have I Been Pwned got started. But where did you really start? Oh, boy, how far back do we go? <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny, like I, I guess the, the most relevant part is, is where did I start in, in technology? Because I think one of the, the joys of technology is that you can pivot to so many different things. And for me, it really started when I was a, a teenager. I was living in Singapore and I was, uh, I was there in the last couple of years of my high school and I was just sort of getting an interest in computers, mostly by hacking around with games and things. And I got an opportunity to do some part-time work for a satellite systems company. Just It was just hardware maintenance stuff. Mm-hmm. And for the next, uh, I guess, three, four years or something through uh, school and then into university, I'd, I'd just be tinkering away with hardware. This was the mid-90s, so it was like, hey, there's this new thing called the internet, and I was helping people get on the internet. And then it went into web development and then architecture because that's what corporate makes you do if you want to progress your career. I'm upset about that. That's another discussion. <laughs> and, and I just kind of then drifted into the security side of things because it just felt like there was a vacuum of good information, particularly security information for developers who, in my mind, are the ones who kind of need it most because they're the ones who keep writing all the flaky software that <laughs> has these holes in it. And everything has just been like, well, then one thing led to another and now here we are. So, okay. So you got started at an early age, you got really interested in hardware hacking, and then it just kind of snowballed. But let's talk a moment for like the companies that kind of, you know, got you there. Would you say that one was more pivotal, even though it might have been what you wanted, what you needed to kind of give you that push? Well, you mentioned Pfizer. So I was at Pfizer for 14 years, which I think in anyone's book is a really, really long time. And I guess the thing that happened and... uh, Look, I mean, I got to the end of my time there and and let let me just politely say I didn't really want to be there. (laughs) But the thing that that did for me is when I was there for for many, many years as a software developer and and then they sort of did the thing which many people have had in their companies, which is if you want your career to progress, you should stop doing the thing that you're good at and become like a manager. That that doesn't sound like much fun, but okay. And when I I went into this, this management and architecture kind of role, I found like there was just this this deficit in my soul of being able to build stuff and tinker with stuff. So I started writing the blog. And then the blog led to writing things about security. And then that led to writing Have I Been Pwned because I wasn't writing code at work. I was looking at, at a frankly, pretty terrible code that vendors are writing for us. So that the fact that the organization went in a direction which really wasn't pleasing for me created this desire to go out and do what I've now done. So Pfizer was, was definitely the, the pivotal organization, not because it gave me the skills, but because it, it drove me to go and do something myself that I probably wouldn't have done if I was just going to work happy every day. I think this is what I meant about you always get what you want versus what you need in order to do this. Because now, I mean, have I been Poland averages something like 160 thousand daily visitors and you provide a service that I think really is crucial to so many people who otherwise would never know that they needed to do something or even understand and have an awareness of their security protections going on. And I also think it's actually not so much indirectly, but directly contributed to our mass adoption of two-factor authentication. So it's not a small thing. It's a really monumental thing. And okay, if Pfizer was a little bit shitty for getting you there, I think it's actually better for all of the rest of us. Yeah, look, I'm with you. And like, I look back at many aspects of my 
professional and personal life over the year. And there are things where at, at the time they, they felt they felt terrible in, in different ways. But I always have trouble sort of feeling remorseful or regretful about any of them. If, if I look at, at where I am now and where have I been pwned is now and, the, and the, hopefully the positive impact I've been able to have because it's like, look, I'm very happy with this. And were it not mm-hmm. for those things that, that shaped me and drove in the direction that I have ultimately taken now, I wouldn't be here. So it's like, all right, you're right. It did feel shitty a lot of the time. But that has what has led to this. Yeah. Yeah, because I think, honestly, there's a lot of people who have had those moments in their career that can actually see this as a source of inspiration to get off their butts and do something they genuinely love. Uh, And again, I think not everyone's going to have the success that you do with like governments using Have I Been Pwned and having it be integrated into a lot of like more commercial uh, products like Okta and 1Password and Eve. But I do think that it, it, you know, sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need a bit of butt kicking in order to get you to do the right thing. So, hey, so, you know, when you originally had the idea of how I have I been pwned, like where did it start? Did you have a beat yourself? Did you see a friend have it? I mean, what gave you the spark to start? I, I guess the spark was in, in 2013, there was the Adobe data breach and yeah. I was in Adobe twice and I, I found it fascinating because I never gave my data to Adobe. <laughs> so, okay, why was I in there twice and why was I in Adobe at all? Well, the reason is, is that I had a work account and I had a personal account and I'd never used Adobe, but I was a Macromedia Dreamweaver fan back in the day and Adobe mm-hmm purchased Macromedia. And I found it very interesting that I could provide my data in one context in one location. And I'm sure that Macromedia probably dated back to about 1999. (laughs) Like there's literally a different millennium. And I provided this information, then it flowed down into somewhere else. And then it was out there on the internet. And I I thought, you know, like if, if I don't know where my data is and I don't know where it appears, then there must be other people who don't know as well, particularly people who are less, I guess, in tune with this industry. So that, that was kind of like half of my motivation. Half of the motivation was I think this would be a good service. The other half of the motivation was to the previous point about being in a, in a corporate environment where I wasn't getting to do hands-on stuff. I wanted to build stuff, right? I really wanted to build some software. And I was getting particularly interested in uh, Azure and particularly interested in platform as a service paradigms. And they were things that I wanted to drive the organization towards in my architecture capacity but I wanted to understand in my developer capacity. So I was like, okay, I'll just kill two birds with one stone and I'll actually build something in anger that isn't just hello world. And that's how Have I Been Pwned started. That's fantastic. And so just a, a quick idea, that was where you started. I mean, and now it's growing. You started initially scraping breaches yourself. I'm guessing that people helped you by contributing along the way or how has that team develop? Is that like a dedicated team or do you have friends and researchers all over the place that give you stuff? How does that go? I wish I was that organized. It's <laughs> <laughs> so what you got to remember is basically everything with Have I Been Pwned is, is accidental in one way or another. Like everything that it, it does today was not planned. Like I didn't sit down in 2013 and plan all of the things that it does today, certainly not the exposure and the influence it has. Everything has just been uh, adjusting to needs at the time. Now, I had never thought about how am I going to get data. I certainly didn't expect, I just passed 500 data breaches the other day. I certainly didn't expect to get there. So I started going and collating, it was I think five or six different data breaches, predominantly Adobe and then a few other small things. Mm -hmm. And I went and found them myself because they're all over the place. And very quickly after that, people started reaching out to me and they're like, here's the data, here's the data. And now like every single day I get up and people are sending me data breaches. Like I've got lists of dozens and dozens of really major incidents that I'm just trying to find time to process. I mean, the the last few days, I've had a little bit of time. This is basically how I've been using my weekend uh, to go through and load incidents that are seven figure, eight figure uh, incidents. They're all sent from someone else. I never, ever go out and look for this stuff myself anymore. Oh, whoa. Okay. So there's no official team, but you have like an unofficial volunteer distribution group. Correct. Correct. And look, there's enough people out there that I think sort of support the vision. They see Have I Been mm-hmm. Pwned being run as a predominantly mm-hmm. community first yeah. sort of initiative as well. They they want to contribute. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's actually kind of nice in a way because this is going to sound really obnoxious when I say it this way, but there's all these people out there who work for Have I Been Pwned and I never have to pay them and, <laughs> and they do it voluntarily and they just pop up out of the woodwork. Uh, and that's fantastic. And also I don't have any responsibility. Like I don't have to manage people or do stuff like that. 
So in, in that regard, it actually works really, really nicely. Hey, and so like, I'm just wondering, have you ever had any weirdo situations? Have you ever had any tricky uh, moments where someone gave you stuff and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm holding this radioactive crap and I need to verify this or I need to let them know or maybe it wasn't even public yet. Have you ever had any of those that anonymized you can talk about? Well, look, I mean, first of all, I verify everything. So, yeah, the, the last thing I loaded uh, at the time of, of um, recording, I can't remember the name of this one, but every single one, it was in the press. Oh, it was Pixlr. So it was a service called mm-hmm. Pixlr, which is like a photo editing app. Mm-hmm. Now it's in the mm-hmm. press. Someone had literally forwarded me on the data breach disclosure notices. So I said, okay, cool. I don't have to do disclosure. They have had a breach. It's I think it was about 1.9 million records. I got data that was about 1.9 million records. I still go through and make sure that this is very likely to have come from the alleged organisation. Now, mm-hmm. I use those terms carefully because I can never be 100% sure, but I'll do things like look at email addresses in the breach. Do they exist on the service? There's usually an enumeration vector on either password reset or registration. So I can sort of go, hey, do the email addresses in the alleged breach match the email address on the website? Yes. And it's in the press and the sending disclosure notices. Good job. Okay. That's an easy one to deal with. There have been heaps where I've had to do disclosure. Uh, ah. So there, are, there would have been, there, there must have been a hundred different occasions now where I've done some form of disclosure and either the organisation's known about it already or it's been brand new stuff. Uh, I mean, something like Discuss, for example. So I think they were like 17 million records. One of them Whoa. was mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've had to do that. The really volatile stuff, uh, one of the big ones that comes to mind is someone someone got in touch with me about the Australian Red Cross Blood Service having a uh. database backup publicly facing. And, mm-hmm. I, in fact, I use this in a bunch of my talks where I'm sort of showing the the DMs that we're having with each other. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying to the guys, like, oh, man, like, this is really interesting. I might be in there myself. I've donated blood before. And yeah. the guy's like, yeah, you are. Here's your data. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. That makes it easy. But it's, it's health data, right? So right. If, if we get into health data, that's a serious mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Adult websites, mm-hmm. generally serious because of the connotations around them. And then there are some really, really weird variations of that. And I'm not even going to name which ones they are. Just like, go to have I been pwned? Who's been pwned? Look for the ones that are flagged sensitive. But some of them are really <laughs> way out there okay. to the point where some of them are very borderline on the legalities. Uh, oh, so lovely. Is this, yeah, well, I mean, one of them, in, I'm going to try and figure out how to say this without getting too much detail. One of them asked a lot of questions around how consensual the content that was being posted there was. But but then we're like, okay, it is a data breach. It is people's yeah. personal information that's been exposed. Um, if law enforcement contacts me, I can probably tell them where to, oh, I can put them in touch with the person who sent me the data and they can have that discussion. But for me, it's like it's another data breach. I want it loaded so that people understand their exposure. So let's talk about a couple of those then. Uh, one of the breaches that you are like quite known for is also around stuff, uh, the work that you've done with, for example, Ashley Madison. So let's talk about Ashley Madison for a second. Um, I think everyone knows roughly what Ashley Madison is, but it's basically a site where you try to hook up with other people and it uh, takes personal information about you and it threatened to release um, actually, uh, there was a group that actually threatened to release all of the Ashley Madison stuff if they wouldn't shut down. And then they leaked 60 gigabytes of Ashley Madison data, including user records. And I know that I had a talk once with Rudolf Temming, who was going through the Ashley Madison stuff, and he was showing us all the .gov email addresses that were also in there. That was really interesting. Hey, <laughs> and, yeah, those um, people want to find love too, you know. Yeah, that's true. And so uh, you got a lot of mails from folks asking for your help. Um, so do you want to talk about that for a second? Like what's the responsibility? Well, you know, I think first of all, one, one thing to be clear about is is Ashley Madison's uh, strap line said it all. So their, their strap line was life is short, have an affair. And, and the thing that was really controversial about Ashley Madison was that it existed with the express purpose of having an affair. So Immediately, it, it falls into that that sort of very dubious moral grey area where people will will prejudge anyone who has a presence on the service. Now, there's uh, there's a whole bunch of of interesting feedback which then came from people, um, and I'm, I'm going to look at what some of it is now. I, I actually wrote a blog post called um, "Here's What Actually Madison Members Have Told Me," 
and it was mm-hmm. it was sort of a really interesting blog post to write because I, I wanted to sort of express to people that we look at this this incident through a lens of everyone there is an adulterer and and you know screw those guys they deserve to have their data public and that, that's not what I believe but I, I can see where people would develop that sentiment from and what was really interesting is when I actually got these messages and I got hundreds, if not thousands of messages because I'd put on Have I Been Pwned and I wrote a blog post about it. I was meant to be snowboarding at the time. I completely messed up my holiday. But it was a really big incident. And it was things like um, some of these really, really uh, hit me when they were about families. So I've got a heading here, the impact on families. So that these are quoted, some of the things people sent. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just a guy here with a wife that I really love. I regret what I did. I have two beautiful kids that will get sucked into this. It's just too horrible. Oh. The one that really got me here was uh, tell your wife and kids you love them tonight. I shall do the same as I really don't know if, I have, if I'll have many more chances to do so. And it's kind of like, wow. And then there was like stuff like um, uh, there are multiple instances where I had women contact me and like, let's be honest, this was like mostly men and bots, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. this is, Mm -hmm. this is who was on the service, but there were some women had multiple occasions where women contacted me and they said, I was really worried my husband was having an affair using Ashley Madison. So I created an account on there to try and find him, Mm -hmm. found him. Yeah. Like the guys out there trying to have affairs, Uh, relationship broke up, disaster. I moved on, life continues, but now I'm in the data. Yeah. my, and, and in some cases, it was even, like, it's like my church is picking this data up and yeah. posting it to the bulletin board so that they can see everyone who's within the congregation who was on Ashley Madison. And so, wow, this is really interesting because there is mm-hmm. a complete other side of that story. And there are so many examples where membership of the service was so much more nuanced than someone in a happy marriage looking to have an affair. So if we take about the, take a, a, a look up the victims that are there in Ashley Madison, Indeed, there's a sort of tenuous moral ground. But why don't we take a look at the, the victims of like the VTech stuff and the cloud pet stuff? Because then we're talking an entirely different group whose data would potentially be at compromise. Yeah, well, now I started to talk about kids. Uh, I was talking about kids, connected things, connected toys in some cases. So VTech, uh, Hong Kong toy maker. So they had a, a data breach a number of years ago now where... It's kind of interesting that the way this happened, there's uh, a guy who was in the UK. We believe he was probably a minor because his details were never published anywhere. Very often it is children. It's like either legally children like you are 17 or less Mm -hmm. or very young adults. Anyway, so this guy finds uh, SQL injection, direct object reference, like basically all the InfoSec 101 problems. Fantastic, yeah. Allegedly he didn't believe the company would take it seriously. Now, then, if this is true, he's got good grounds for not believing that the company would take it seriously because there's a big track record of this. So rather than trying to get in touch with them and do responsible disclosure, he just picks all the data up, he sends over to Lorenzo at Motherboard, and then Lorenzo, Lorenzo he gets in touch with me and he's like, hey, Troy, like, here's all this data. And we put it in Have I Been Pwned and wrote stories about it. Uh, and it was a big thing. And, and part of the thing that made it a big thing is that you've got all these kids' profiles in there as well. Exactly. From memory, it was like kids' names and their photos too. I don't think I got sent the photos, but I had the names. And then it was like uh, the name, the age, the gender, and a foreign key to the parent, and the parent had a physical address. So the concern is it's like, well, this could just about be like a harvest your own child kind of thing. Now, I, I have no evidence to suggest that happened, and I think that that's getting a little bit hyperbolic, but I can see the concern as well. So that was a really interesting one. And, and then Cloud Pets was... <laughs> That uh, just sounds funny to even to explain this. Like imagine you take a teddy bear and you go, let's put a listening device in it and we'll put it in every child's room. Like this is what cloud pets were. And cloud pets would have a little button on the paw so that you could activate the microphone, you could record into it, it would Bluetooth to a parent's device up into the cloud, then down to another parent's device somewhere else because mum's working mm-hmm. late or something like that. Mm-hmm. And that the problem with cloud pets was that the issue wasn't so much with the cloud pet itself or with the mobile app or anything, but they put everything in a MongoDB and left it publicly facing. <sighs> and this was in an era when a lot of Mongo was left out there, not just publicly facing, but without a password. Of course. So, of course, all that got harvested and, you know, that had things like kids' voice recordings and, and that kind of thing in there as well. And I, I think what's uh, sort of an interesting social observation here as well, which is I don't actually know what 
you could do with just a kid's name or a kid's voice or even a kid's photo. It's not going to be identity theft. You're not going to log into their Gmail or anything mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. that. But there is something about it that just feels yeah. really, really icky. Now, arguably, there's still some sort of uh, not necessarily direct sexual exploitation, but some sort of pedophilia thing to have if you have images and voice. And, you know, it's, yeah, questionable at the very least. I'm not an expert on that side of things. And look, I I mean, I think about my kids and look, if it was my kid's voice recording, my kid's photo, and this is a profile photo that you'd put on a tablet. So one would assume headshot kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, or their names. I don't want that out of my control. I put it out there in many ways by my own free volition in context that Mm -hmm. I'm happy with. I wouldn't feel good if it went out there in another way, but I I am struggling to actually put a point on the harm factor. No, fair enough. But I mean, let's be honest, it was almost a million kids or a million accounts, and it was 2.2 million recordings. So that is... It sounds like egregious. Um, if we if we keep going along the vein of, you know, um, victims who potentially had a faulty moral compass to victims who never should be victimized in the first place to this extortion stuff in Grindr, what's your take on, and I'm, I'm just going to give you free ground here, so you go, go, <laughs> <laughs> on uh, the recent Grindr issues? So Grindr was, was an interesting one. In fact, I did a talk on this only a couple of nights ago, so it's, it's fresh in my mind. Now, someone reached out to me because they couldn't get in touch with people in Grindr. Now, this was about October 2020, so fairly recent at the time mm-hmm. of recording. So they're having trouble getting in touch with someone. It almost goes back to the VTech guy where it's like it is normal to have trouble getting in touch with an organisation. Honestly, like every time I have to do disclosure, I'm just like, ah, oh, crap, not this again. I don't want to have to do this because I know it's going to be hard. So he... Um, he tried to get in touch, couldn't get a response from them, uh, and he tried very reasonable measures. In fact, from memory, he did have a response, but the responses really didn't take it seriously. Now, just before I talk about what I did, to put in context, here's how simple and stupid this vulnerability was. So when you do a password reset, you normally enter an email address, and at the moment you're not authenticated because there's a whole problem. You can't if you've right. got your password. You enter the email address, you click submit, and it will say something like, uh, check your inbox, we've sent you an email. Yeah. You go to your yeah. inbox and there's a URL and it has a, you know, normally a time-limited token, which only mm-hmm. you have. And then you click on that and it's like, ah, you must be you because you got it to your inbox. Yeah. Now set your password. Now, so that token has got an identifier on the end of it. So this is this is meant to be a string, which is not enumerable, not guessable, anything like this. If we go back to the website, when you entered that email address of whoever you wanted and clicked submit, if you looked at the response that came back, you looked at the JSON that was actually came back in this async API, it had the secret token in it already. So you could literally just pick the secret token up, paste it into the URL for password reset, and you could figure this out by creating a Grindr account and then just doing a password reset on your own account. And now you had everything that you needed to pick any Grindr account so long as you knew the email address and then change their password. And, of course, once you can change the password, you get into their account and you get to see all of their messages and everything else that they've been doing on there, as well as all the other personal attributes of them, which also in Grindr, as I learned when I got into this thing, includes your HIV status. So oh, there's like my a God. bunch of really, really personal data on there. Now, Grindr was, was really nuanced in other ways as well because Grindr was bought by a Chinese company. Now, keeping in mind that Grindr is first and foremost a gay dating service, uh, as I learned when when myself and and Scott Helm, I think you've met Scott before as well, Jaya, uh, we we sort of set up a, a scenario where he had the account and then I was the one getting into the account. We learned very quickly, how can you put it politely? It is very, very uh, explicit and very, very, let's say enthusiastic as soon as you create an account. Yeah. So... When we had this situation where, where a Chinese organisation bought it, the US ended up turning around and going, look, there's actually risks to national security. And I imagine what they're looking at is millions and millions of people in there with a huge amount of leverageable material against them. So I then had to go back to the US and we sort of had this whole thing happen right around this transition time. So they were trying to do things like put in place bug bounties. And I do legitimately believe they're trying to do that. I, I did speak with people from Grindr later on. I think it was the CTO or someone senior enough to have confidence mm-hmm. they're doing that. But it's like you, you just, you did that too late, you know, like it's, it's, it's 2020 at the time, like you should have had this in place by then. Mm-hmm. So that was, um, that was a noteworthy one. But 
never went into have I been pwned because there never ended up being a data breach with lots of data. It was just individual account takeover. Just, I'm mean, quoting. <sighs> okay, so um, if, you know, we think about like the relevance of these kinds of things and, and the fact that Grindr is going to be lax, what is the strategy that you would promote to websites that know a priori they're going to contain this kind of information beyond the basic measures of just doing good coding and good uh, testing of the stuff that they put out there, what would you recommend uh, that they should definitely do in addition? Would it be a bug bounty program? Is it responsible disclosure? What would you recommend? Yeah, so uh, yes to all of the above. Uh, <laughs> and I think when we, when we say the basics, there's maybe a question of what should the basics be these days. And, and I, I, would, I would posit that it depends very much on the size of the organisation, the nature of the content. Grinder is a very notable service with very, very sensitive information. Even rudimentary penetration tests would have discovered this very, very quickly. So mm -hmm. I have the impression that that had not been done. The mm -hmm. bug bounty program, and, and I, I think they were right in the mix of uh, getting things on, on Hacker One as well, so they would actually have a, a bounty program. Mm -hmm. Bug bounty program does get eyes. Someone would have found that very, very quickly. Now, look, it, it may be that it wasn't exploited in the wild and we effectively managed to re kind of mess our way through it anyway, but you'd much rather someone find that as early as possible and disclose it through a ratified formal channel. Uh, and, and in the mm -hmm. case of the person who found it, maybe get themselves a little reward as well because let's face it, that's a juicy one. Right? That is worth something. Yeah. I, I yeah. would love for the person that found it to have actually been rewarded something. I, I don't think he actually got anything. <laughs> I think that would have been reasonable. Hey, and so like, if these are the good things, what's the worst thing? What is the dumbest thing you've seen companies do? I mean, you gave us a couple of examples of just bad security practice and then complete, you know, intolerance. But what do you think on the flip side, what's the worst reaction to have post data breach? Threatening me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's one I've spoken about publicly, but there's a service called uh, Adult Fan Fiction. Hmm. And look, I, I learned some things. Uh, looking at that website. And, and what I learned is that this is like, imagine if you wanted to read novels about like vampires and Ewoks having a relationship or you know, something <laughs> like that. Could happen. <laughs> and, you know, like I, honestly, I get to the point with all this stuff, I'm like, I just don't care what you're into. I only care about the data and I only care about the way the organisations respond. So anyway, it, it's it's erotic novels uh, of a, a very um, sort of, you know, vampire, Dracula kind of stuff. Furry kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, and again, like whatever. So someone sends me the data. I do my normal verification. It's legitimate. And I send this, uh, this organisation uh, an email via a published contact channel. So very important. It's like I'm not just sending it off to like info at. It's like I'm going to go to your website mm -hmm. and I'm going to find information that you publish about how you'd like to be contacted. Send off to them. I hear nothing back. After a while, I'm, I'm pretty sure I tweeted uh, and I normally send a tweet like, hey, does anyone have a security contact at adultfanfiction.com? And, of course, when everyone sees that, they're like, oh, crap, this isn't going to be good. I had to do that with Grinder actually, and I'll tell you what, a lot of people – a lot of people got their, yeah, pricked their ears up <laughs> when they saw that. That's how I got the contact eventually. It's like, if I tweet this, I want to reach out. Yeah. But anyway, no one from Adult Fan Fiction reached out. So I get to the point where it's like, how hard do I try to do disclosure before I get to the point where it's like, that's, that's enough. Uh, so I got through several weeks throwing multiple channels, including public outreach. So, yep, yeah, that's enough. Load the data. And then, and then they weren't real happy. <laughs> so then they got in touch and they're like, no, we haven't had a data breach. It's like, well, how do you know that? I have your data. Like I'm literally sending you password hashes. You can go and verify this. Mm -hmm. And they wrote some things on forums about sending lawyers and stuff after me. And apparently I try to sell some sort of a service related to that in my workshops, which is complete rubbish. Now, all those threads were, were subsequently deleted. Uh, I did get a mm -hmm. backup of them, <laughs> which goes into yeah. someone talks. Yeah. But it's that sort of reaction where... They do not want to believe. And, I, and I'm sympathetic to the extent that very often this is with people standing these services up with like cheap uh, off-the-shelf forum software, which they mm -hmm. never maintain, and there's an O-Day mm -hmm. somewhere, and it, it becomes like a 700-day by the time someone comes along yeah. and actually exploits it. they got no idea what they're doing. They don't live in this world. But when I get a reaction which is not receptive 
I can understand mm-hmm. them being a bit dubious. I can understand them maybe not wanting to say thank you because they're not having a good day out of it. But when I get one particularly that's threatening, you yeah. know, I've, I've, I've often sort of had this discussion with, with friends or, or my partner. It's like this is only going to end one way, which is this is going to be public and they're going to look stupid. And it's just going to be a matter of like how, how bad it works out for them because no one's ever going to send lawyers after me and have any success for something like this. It's just, yeah. it's, it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. But it does happen on occasion. Yeah. So if we, you know, you've, you've done this for a while. This is not your first rodeo. Uh, so-, uh, so you know how to, you know how to approach companies and, you know, deal with the idiots that would rather pay for lawyers than investigate uh, what's happening and how to fix it. Um, you know, I have to think that like there's a lot of younger researchers uh, you mentioned before there was a teenager who had actually found the cloud pet stuff, probably. There's younger people who wouldn't necessarily have that same experience and would be completely terrified in the face of some of these threats. How would you, what would you advise to them? Also, like, how would you prevent them from getting themselves into, like, enormously tricky soup? And if- well, I think we've almost got to take a step back and and say like where where is the crossroads where you, you could go either way now that the NCA in the UK has done some good work around uh, how do we actually educate parents about the fact that there are these decisions you can make and I think they called it something like cyber crossroads or cyber pathways mm-hmm. uh, and they've actually got a very funny video of a of a couple sitting there talking about how smart their son is and then the video turns around they're actually talking to the police because the cops have come to pick the guy up. And I think one thing we've got to acknowledge is a lot of kids, particularly around, let's say, 15 years old, give or take a couple of years, who are developing the capabilities to be able to do this sort of thing. And let's face it, a lot of the time it's like, hey, I'm just watching a free YouTube tutorial on how to do SQL injection. Yeah. Yeah. So they're developing the capabilities. They lock themselves up in their room. Their parents are not tech savvy, so they don't really know what's going on. And the, the, and the key thing here is they've not yet developed the moral compass to understand the impact of if they siphon the data out and they go and dump it, not just the impact on them in terms of their career and the fact they could legitimately go to jail, but what's the impact socially and all the other people mm-hmm. in there as well. So I think it's, it's, it's a really fascinating thing. Uh, how do we reach these people? And at these crossroads where someone could go down a, a, a path which just messes up the rest of their lives or could go on and just do amazing things because they're really, really smart kids, I find that really fascinating. I did a talk a couple of years ago. If, if people Google it, they'll find it. It was something like Responsible Disclosure 101, Playing Nice and Staying Out of Jail. And it was lots of things like you see all the time there'll be a headline along the lines of um, security researcher has police turn up on doorstep and arrest them after reporting security vulnerability. And you start reading it and they've found, they've found like a direct object reference risk. So they've got a URL, mm-hmm. they look at a number and they go, oh, I'm going to plus one on that. What happens if I plus one? I'll get someone else's data. And then just to make sure it wasn't an accident, they do it another 100,000 times. And it's like, yeah. you're not going to go to jail if you do it once. You know, you might have to have some discussions and that's fine. But stop. <laughs> it's like <laughs> use some common yeah, sense, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. But I can en- understand, you know, they found something, it's like hitting the jackpot and they want to do it again and again and again. Yeah. Well, the, uh, there's that too. I reckon there's a, a really yeah, interesting yeah. bit of psychology here, which is it, it, it is, look, even for me, like I say that grinder thing, it's like when I saw it, there's a little bit of a euphoria. There's, there's a rush, right? It's like, wow, I have found a way of breaching through the cyber walls of this thing. Imagine what I could do. And, and the difference between I could have just taken a great big email list and start throwing at that endpoint and going, how many of these mm-hmm. accounts can I take over? Right. But that that's really not the, the point. And, and the, the only reason I'm hesitating now is I'm thinking back to the VTech guy because it's like, yeah, I, I understood his problem, particularly for a company in Hong Kong. Like if he had mm-hmm. just tried to report this legitimately, mm-hmm. how much traction would he have got? But if he goes, here's millions of records, it's like, hey, now you're paying attention. This is the, the reason I think that there are so many national programs. Like in the Netherlands, there's a program that was started by the Dutch police called HackRite, which is actually trying to take these kids and then Ooh. we develop them. Yeah, it's really cool. But you know, I think we need more of these things also for parents. Um, I think there could be a potential role uh, to play in terms of teaching people how to better protect themselves, also by understanding better the offensive arts. Any plans in that respect? So in my spare time, I've got all of these <laughs> plans. <laughs> I, uh, I have a lot of lists. I literally have a list of like future projects and things. 
Um, I'd like to do, I've done a, a little bit of stuff with the NCA. I'd like to do more of that sort of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm also taking the approach of, I've, I've got an 11 year old son at the moment who is very interested in this. I met him. Yeah, you did. You did. Yeah. Didn't you? In, uh, in Oslo. Yeah. So he's very yeah. interested in this sort of thing as well. I'd like to try and get access uh, into his school. Like I'm trying to be polite about it. Like he's got a new mm-hmm. teacher because uh, mm-hmm. we've just started our school year here in Australia. And I want to sort of go, hey, you know, like I'm a really big deal on the internet. Can I come and help you guys <laughs> you know, do some of the stuff and talk to you without sounding like an obnoxious dick? But I'd like to be able to do that sort of stuff. But I'm conscious that that's like, yeah, it's like one school in one city in one country. And, and I think there's a lot more that we can do online around education. Yeah. So this is actually a really interesting thing. So I tried to do the same thing when I was CISO at KPN. And uh, what we figured out is it's not just the parents. It's also the teachers. The teachers aren't able to support their kids with a digital education. So we took some kids and we brought them over and we gave them training. But I really think doing something online for parents and for kids, that would be the way to go. Yeah, the, the teacher thing's a really interesting observation. It was... Uh, I saw it particularly clearly in 2020 as we went into COVID and suddenly everyone had to self-learn or, you know, learn from home and watching teachers trying to make stuff work. <laughs> it's like, yes, that's, exactly. Well, it was entertaining, don't get me wrong, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do this full-time job and have all these projects and live in surfer's paradise? How do you, <laughs> <laughs> how do you combine all of it? It's a good question. You're asking me on a good day. So um, I'm, I'm getting a lot of help from, from my fiancé. You know, Charlotte, I don't know if you know, but we got engaged. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, she's, she's just been really good at helping me get organised because I've got so many different projects and things on the go at once. There's all the stuff that people know publicly as well, a whole bunch of other things on the boil. Mm-hmm. So I'm really... Yeah, the discussion we've been having literally the last couple of days is, is can you please project manage me? <laughs> you know, yeah. like, can you keep me on track? Because my yeah. problem is, like, I look around the room here, there's so much stuff that distracts me. Like, I've got IoT stuff all over the place. Oh, yeah. The other day I decided I really wanted, like, a live count of have I been pwned followers. So I was like, oh, well, I'm going to get That's a That's so cool. Count. It it is right. You know yeah. what I was doing while I was doing this? Nothing else. <laughs> so that's my problem. Like I've got to stay focused, and uh, yeah. I got to do all the cool stuff that I want to have fun with. Because to, to me, like my leisure time is yeah, playing with IoT or, or doing something like that. Now, I, like I, I am really physically active and I get outdoors a lot too. But if if I'm here in the office, I get distracted a lot by these things. Yeah. So I need to try and maintain focus on things like I've, I've made commitments to deliver courses and stuff like that. Like I've got to actually sit down and do this stuff too. <sighs> By the way, I, I have to say this because I just want to ask you this. Um, but like, you know, on talks, everyone has their favorite communicable way to explain, you know, why passwords are important. I always use the underwear one, which I stole long ago from someone who thought about it, which is, you know, it's better when they're long. It's better when they're, uh, when you change them off and, yeah, and you don't leave them lying around. I thought that was that was a pretty accurate underwear password thing. What's your favorite? I, I, first of all, I have a little bit of an issue with that one, and I know I've got a lot of traction. I know I can sort of circulate <laughs> a little. And the, the bit of the issue I have is the changing it frequently bit. Because yeah, you know, back in the day, we'd like yeah. change yeah. your password frequently because yeah. you only had one and it was at work yeah. and it was in. Now we have. Now, yeah. Well, I think you've got to look at it from both angles. So now we've sort of gone to the point where uh, authentication providers should really stop forcing people to do that on a regular cadence because a whole mm-hmm. bunch of reasons according to mm-hmm. the NCSC and all the rest of it. Yeah. And then there's the other bit, which as an individual, you have so many of them, this concept of you changing them regularly is kind of unworkable. So what are yeah. the things that you should do instead? Yeah. Look, I, to, to me, I just keep it really simple and I, I sort of explain to people, you know how every password is meant to be unique, right? Like it's mm-hmm. not meant to be the same as other ones. Mm-hmm. And you know how you got lots of them, right? And you know how they're meant to be complex so you can't guess them. How are you going to do that? Get a password yeah. manager and move on. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah. That, I agree. It boils down to it for me. Yeah. No, and to be f- fair, I would say change them, you know, frequently or something or, or often or I don't know what I say. But the point is that it actually goes against the current NIST advice. So the current NIST advice is also, you know, not to change them all the time. But I think in companies where you have single sign-on and you still have like a, a one password to unlock the rest, there might be some liquidity that makes sense. 
but yeah. I think in, in this defense that the guidance was for for they, they refer to them as verifiers so for mm-hmm. entities that need to verify the credentials because this idea of like every three months in the office change the password and everyone's just like incrementing the number at the end you know yeah. like over and over and over again but uh, what I really like about this advice, and, and again, it was echoed by like the NCSC too and, and Microsoft, is uh, th- there's lots of other things we can do now that we couldn't do back in the yeah, day yeah. when you, you rotate passwords. We've got a lot of things like you know, human behavioural analytics. It's, you know, Bob comes into the office in Sydney each week and he logs in. Well, Bob doesn't come into the office though because COVID. Bob used to come into the office in <laughs> Sydney each week, <laughs> logs into the sales department and, and he does his work and he logs off five o'clock and goes home. One day, Bob logs in from Beijing and pulls down five gigabytes worth of marketing material. So maybe it's not Bob, you know, but we only know that when we look at the behavioural norms and the deviations from them. So we have things like that now that we didn't have before. Mm. We've got the ubiquitous transport layer encryption, which we didn't have before. So we've got lots of other things that work in our favour, as well, of course, all the different ways we can authenticate using NFC and the likes of that as well. Yeah. Hey, and is there any last uh, good password joke that we should all know? Like Phil Zimmerman's always is like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to craft a really good uh, kind of funny haha line in my password. And if I ever hear from someone else, then I know it was compromised. So do you have any? <laughs> No, it's it's just a joke. He obviously does not do that, but um, um, uh, it's it's like you, you hear all the um, all the ones like oh, I'm, I'm going to make all my passwords uh, the word incorrect, so that when I try and log on, it reminds me what my password was. <laughs> no, okay, no, terrible advice. Yeah, okay. Well, Troy, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your aha moments. I hope there's a lot more of those to come, and I can't wait to visit you in Surfers Paradise. You have to. It's nice here. Ha, ha, ha.